Um, today, I guess we'll be doing longitudinal level of the lesion, okay? So this is a, another fundamental understanding in functional neurology. Somebody's going to come in with an issue, and you're going to have to try and find what's the source of the issue. Where is it coming from, right? Now, in chiropractic, there's one source. It's always subluxation. But in real life, it's a little bit more complicated than that. So when you are thinking about your patient, you're going to get a lot off the history, first of all, before you even start testing them. And your history is usually going to answer where the lesion is. Then you can use your testing to start localizing it. So we can just start working our way through these. There's seven levels, and you always have all seven of these kind of mapped out in your head when they're complaining to you, okay? So this person's going to come in, and they're going to say, my main complaint is my arm hurts right here. So how do we know what's the problem? Is it the arm? Is it the nerve? Is it the brain? It could be anything. But there's different patterns that lesions start to fall into. So if all their only problem is it hurts right here, and then you do an inspection of the area, and there's a giant wound on the skin, then it's end organ. That actually where they're pointing is where the problem's coming from. Maybe they could have scar tissue there. Maybe they could have a cyst there. Maybe they could have a tumor there. Maybe they threw a baseball and they tore their ligament. So end organ is a very real possibility with a lot of things. If somebody sprains their ankle, it's going to be an end organ issue. You're not going to treat the brain to help them with their sprained ankle. And so how do we treat end organs? Well, it's chiropractic. We can adjust the area. We can do soft tissue. We can do different types of physical therapy modalities. That kind of stuff, okay? So end organ, if it's going to be an end organ, think one problem, one location. Okay, so the next par par place that this could be coming from is the peripheral nerve, right? So my hand hurts, right? But you look at the hand, the hand's totally fine. Let's start thinking, is it coming from a peripheral nerve? And peripheral nerve is going to be anywhere from the spinal cord to the hand itself. So we could think of mainly, I usually think about two different things. I think either radiculopathy, the spinal nerve is compressed at the spinal cord due to a herniation or something, or else a peripheral nerve entrapment due to a muscular contraction. The idea is if you're going to have a peripheral nerve issue, it's going to be along a nerve pattern and it's going to be fairly localized. So if my right median nerve is entrapped at my pronator teres, that'd be an example of a peripheral nerve lesion, right? What's going to happen is my leg doesn't hurt, my hand hurts. So now we, we can start ruling out, we know that it's either end organ or peripheral nerve since it's in this hand, right? And we start looking at the hand and different sensory deviations are saying, oh look, the median nerve is out. Like we don't have sensation here, here, here. But we have sensation here. So we can start thinking nerve, right? Other problems with peripheral nerves would be, what? Weakness, right? Loss of uh, deep tendon reflexes, and then loss of pain and temperature, and tactile. So if I have a median nerve entrapment right here, my pronator teres, I'm gonna have a lack of pinwheel sensation on my hand, I'm gonna have a lack of tuning fork on my hand. Um, but then again, it could be like a C6 nerve root lesion coming from my spinal cord because it fell on my head and ruptured my disc. And if that's the case, then the pattern of weakness and sensory loss is going to be different than the median nerve entrapment. So we can use our different diagnostic criteria to start localizing where it is on the peripheral nerve. But when we see more than one thing, like we see, let, let's say we just see my flexor carpial nerves is weak. That's it. Maybe it's end organ. But if flexor carpial ulnaris is weak, and flexor profundus is weak, and flexor carpi radialis is weak, all three of those, then there's multiple things going on, then it's probably peripheral nerve. So what we're going to look for in peripheral nerve is we're going to look like sensory loss, deep tendon reflex loss, and then we're going to be uh, weakness. Alright, so the next level is going to be spinal cord lesion. Now, like, if somebody has a spinal cord lesion, they'll probably know before they come to your office. It's probably like they fell off their motorcycle or they got stabbed or something. And they're going to go to the hospital first and they'll tell them you've got a spinal cord issue. But 
um, with the spinal cord issue, things start to get a little bit more complicated. So it's not like I have a spinal cord issue and the only thing that hurts is my hand. Now it's going to be like, well, okay, so there's a big giveaway for spinal cord lesions. You know what the big giveaway is? Bonus? Nope. It's called sensory disassociation. Sensory disassociation means I'm going to have a loss of pain and temperature in one side of my body and then a loss of tactile on the opposite side. You'll only see that with a spinal cord lesion. You'll never see that anywhere else. So if it's a peripheral nerve lesion right here, I'm going to have a loss of both of those. If it's a spinal cord, it's going to be on one side of the body and the other. So there's a couple different spinal cord lesions we do need to be aware of, like lateral compressive lesions, what's going to be the pattern that's going to go on there. And you're going to start seeing like things are going to decussate lower and some things are going to stay on the side. So if my spinal cord starts getting cut off on this side because there's bacteria eating their way through it, what's going to happen on this side? What's going to happen on this side? I'm going to lose dorsal column on this side since that runs ipsilateral and I'll lose pain and temperature on this side. So that means that this person, they're going to, what's their history going to say? They're going to say, well, when I get in the bathtub, my left foot, feels fine because they don't have pain and temperature, and they get my right foot and it burns me. It's because they don't have pain and temperature on that side, but they don't even realize. They're burning their left leg, they just don't realize. You start modifying your things. Now, spinal cord lesions can be difficult to treat. I think a lot of these are surgical. There was some research that using omega-3s early on in spinal cord lesions have like a really big effect on the regenerative abilities, so supplement these guys up with fish oil, but that applies to almost everything. So know when to treat a spinal cord lesion. And if it's an anterior cord lesion, they're gonna have losses of volitional movements because their anterior cortical spinal tract is right up there. So they're gonna have like finger weakness. But again, look for these. And then lastly, syrinx or uh, syringomyelia is gonna be right in the middle of the spinal cord, blows up with uh, liquid, and they're gonna lose the decussating pain and temperature pathways. So they'll have no pain and temperature perception like on both sides, but they'll have tactile. That's a sensory disassociation. They're missing one but not the other. So that's spinal cord. All right, so you start getting into brain stem, things get even more complicated. What's the biggest thing that lives in the brain stem? Easy question. Come on. Cranial nerves, right? <laughs> Granular. It's a big question. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so if they, have, if they have any problem in their brain stems, their, their cranial nerves are going to start showing up, which means, like, what do the cranial nerves control? All sorts of things, right? Maybe they'll have some drooping on their side of the face. And you're going to have to start deciding, well, is that drooping on the side of the face a peripheral nerve lesion? Because it could be the facial nerve after it's out of the CNS, or is it a brain stem issue? And then also you're going to have to decide is it ablative or is it non-ablative. Ablative means it's dead. You had a stroke in your brain stem, neurons die, there's no way we can bring those back. But let's say this person's face is just a little droopy, so they have like, this is TND, hello. They have like TND and then you do an input to their brain stem and it gets better. Well, that's non-ablative. So, so you have to decide that as you start going. Um, but the big thing, start looking at cranial nerves. Typically what happens with the non-ablative lesions is pons and medulla start going downhill and getting TND. Mesencephalon will get ramped up. It will be hyperactive. So maybe they'll have like a really strong pupil response or something. But um, start looking at that kind of stuff. Other things in the brainstem include autonomic dysfunction, right? Nucleus tractus solitarius controls all your parasympathetics to the vagus nerve. That's a cranial nerve but also PMRF lives in the brain stem. You're gonna start having PMRF issues and then they're gonna have sympathetic on one side and loss of sympathetics on the other. Maybe they'll have parasympathetic issues too though. So start looking at the brain stem and then also all your sensory and motor tracts also go through the brain stem. So a different lesion in anywhere is gonna start making different references. But you can, you can try and decide where in the brain stem it is. Is it in the mesencephalon? Is it in the pons? Is it in the medulla? Start localizing. So what was our big thing for the brain stem? Cranial nerves. 
A cerebellum is the next place they could have a lesion. This is like super, super common. Um, the cerebellum has as many neurons as a big brain, but they're just packed into a way denser area. So what it means is that they're really susceptible to chemical damage, to autoimmune damage, to biochemical problems, all that stuff. So cerebellum gets jacked. Now cerebellum controls motion and balance. So somebody who just had a stroke in their cerebellum, they're going to have huge balance issues, or they'll have vertigo issues. But you also just keep your eye out for hypermetria. Like it's not hard to see. You don't even need to be test. You don't even need to be doing finger to nose. Like watch as they are trying to write their name on their notes. Like that observation is everything in neurology. You could even see hypermetria when you're not testing them. And that's actually better because then they're not trying to make it better. They're just acting normal. So look for breakdown and smooth coordinated motion in anything you do. And that's going to be your like big thing to a cerebellar lesion. Also, if they have like a right cerebellum, just crashes, they're going to have hypotonia on this side of their body. They're going to fall towards that side of the body. Maybe like their center of pressure is over here because the cerebellum is jacked. So cerebellum is a really big one. But mainly in cerebellum problems start thinking coordination. but also biochemical too. Next possible longitudinal level lesion is going to be basal ganglia. Basal ganglia is, edits your motor output, breakdown in basal ganglia can be too much movement or too little movement, all right? So there's a direct and an indirect pathway. If the indirect pathway breaks down, you can't give the green light to go, they're going to have bradykinesia, too little movement. If you can't give them the red light, they're going to be, what, tachykinesia? I don't know, too much motion. But you can start, there's going to be different patterns of basal ganglionic issues. We still need to learn more about these, but that's another big one. Um, just look for them having trouble. Like, like, let's say this. This is a big one. Open, close your fingers as fast and as wide as you can ten times. and then. They do it 12, 11 times, they couldn't stop it. That's going to be a basal ganglionic finding. But the majority of the basal ganglia lives in the frontal lobe. Some of it lives in the um, diencephalon. A little bit lives in the brain stem. So it's pretty spread out. But so just look inhibition or problems, editing motion. Okay, now the last place that you can have problems are going to be cortex. And you think with cortex, like, you got a cortex issue, you're going to see findings all over the place. It's not going to be like, oh, just my finger hurts from a, from a thalamus lesion, you know? Like, if they have a thalamic lesion, all sorts of stuff gets messed up. If they have a parietal lobe lesion, all sorts of things get messed up. And so we really need to know the anatomy of the brain. We need to know the functions, the behaviors of the different lobes of the brain. And that's going to include all of our lobes. Frontal, occipital, temporal, parietal, cingulate, thalamic. So these are all, we got to keep our eye on the frontal lobe, and in neurology I think this is really where like we specialize is in rehabbing the cortex, right? So any breakdown in any one of the lobes is going to cause an ipsilateral decrease in the PMRF, right? So let's say the right parietal lobe is gone, the right PMRF isn't going to be as healthy on that side. Or I'd say their left frontal lobe is down, or their left occipital. Like a lesion in any lobe can cause a decrease in the PMRF, and then you're going to start seeing these findings, right? So when you start seeing these findings, this internally rotated arm, this externally rotated leg, this is going to be strong. This will be weak. This will be strong. This will be weak. Like we see a big pattern, right? And this is where we start getting into oh, it's an upper motor neuron. It's a cortical thing. It's not just an internally rotated shoulder because there's pec majors messed up, that'd be an end organ thing. But this and this and this and this and this, they all start correlating and make a bigger pattern. 
and that's what we got to look at is look for the path.